I'm so glad to be able to introduce our guest, our keynote speaker today. Um, he's become a good friend of mine, and I'm so glad that he's here today. Bob Warner Jr. is a practicing surgeon from Jonesboro, Arkansas. And you have to know, everybody that we had speaking so far is connected to Mississippi. I don't know how that happened, but it's just amazing. His surgical education was completed at the Medical Music University of South Carolina, and his vascular thoracic surgical training was completed at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. He grew up in Bay St. Louis and, and Waveland on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, where he attended St. Stanislaus High School. He is a partner in AMMC Surgical Clinic, where he relo relocated in 2014. He also serves as the Director of Trauma. He has authorized several, several scientific publications. Bob has served on several boards, including Old Miss Alumni Board. Bob has been a member of the Rotary Club of Jones Jonesboro since 1993 and served as president in 2002-2003. He has held numerous club positions. In 2007, he was presented the club's highest honor, the James F. Grambling Service Award Above Self. Let's see, Bob received the Rotary International Service Above Self Award in 2012. He and his wife, welcome Mary Ellen, thank you for being here. Both are Paul Harris Fellows, Charter uh, Paul Harris Society members, and Bequest Society members. They are member, members of the Arch Club Trustee Circle. They enjoy attending Rotary Conventions, 18 to be exact, college football, travel, pets, gardening, and dining out. Bob is an enthusiastic Joy. duck hunter. I thought I was going to say drink hunter, but. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Ellen and Bob have served two years as training leaders in San Diego International Assembly in 2013-14. Bob has served as Council of Legislation Representative 2016 and 2019. Let's welcome Dr. Bob Warner. so many old friends in the audience and making new friends every minute. You know, friendship is the strongest benefit that we have in our Rotary world, and Julie, thank you for asking us to be here. Really appreciate that. A special greeting goes out to Barbara Malden, who's representing our, 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 our president, Mark Maloney and Gay, and to all the past Rotary officers here today. I want to also just take a, a minute of personal privilege to say something that probably doesn't get said in this room enough, but you all, if you don't know that, have an amazing governor. So when I come to speak somewhere, I tend to do a little bit of homework, and it's become obvious to me that Julie and Bob, um, and by the way, who's blooming the normal sunrise? I've mean, got a great member, Julie Dotsky's in your club. I'd, I'd keep her, keep hold of her. But at any rate, um, your your generosity and your your other things besides Rotary are broad and deep, and it's just very, very. Uh, I admire that very much. So I want to put up. This, let's see. I'm gonna kind of have to look over my shoulder every now and then, so I don't have these totally memorized. But I just want to put this up as a first slide just to thank 6490 as one of the 22 districts in the zone 3031 who have taken part since the very beginning of a scholarship program at the Clinton School of Public Service. In this picture, you'll see Dimas Solomon from Egypt and Ariella Lamonte uh, from Albania. They're the people who look like they just graduated and 
Then there's some other folks there you might recognize. But this was graduation day of our first two global grant scholarships for $50,000. And the way this has worked is each district has put in about $2,000 to uh, match at $25,000 to become a $50,000 scholarship. And um, we've done this several times over the years and we've now had 10 scholars at the Clinton School and there are those of us who are lobbying the powers that be in Rotary to consider that maybe be a peace center. And so thank each and every one of you for that contribution. Thank you very much. So now we get to some more important things. So on the East Coast, football is a cultural experience. In the Midwest, it's often called cannibalism. <laughs> on the west coast it's just simply a tourist attraction but in the deep south football is a religion and Saturday Saturday is the holy day so those of you who know me and know Mary Ellen know that we're pretty serious football fans I'm an old Miss grad Mary Ellen is an old Miss grad my mother was an Ole Miss grad. My dad was an Ole Miss grad. My cousins, my uncle. So you get the point, right? When I grew up in my household, my dad didn't say, if you go to Ole Miss, he said, when you get there. So I didn't have much choice, but I'm glad I made that choice. So just to give you a little more depth into that, I had the same physics teacher as my father. He was somewhat older when he talked me out. I'll, I'll add that in. And on this, certain uh, traditions are passed from generation to generation. One such tradition on game day is tailgating. We have a little place there called the Grove. It's 10 acres. And on game day, it's filled with friends and neighbors, and the fellowship is amazing. The food is amazing. Some future football players are amazing. He's going to be an offensive lineman for us, we hope, in a year or so. Uh, this one is just to show you that there truly are chandeliers of the Grove. And so the point I wanted to make with this is just so you know this. So. At Ole Miss, things do change sometimes, but certain things don't change. And this tradition of fellowship, family, and love has been carefully and completely shared among generations in, in Oxford, Mississippi, on football stat Saturdays for uh, way longer than I've been doing that. I've been tailgating there for 50 years. So what does that have to do with Rotary? Well, Rotary has values that we all know seen a couple of times already today. Truth, fairness, friendship. Gary, thank you for those words earlier in this luncheon. And they culminate in a, culminate in a benefit, really, <clears throat> to um, help communities both locally and internationally. And that's what we're doing here. I see Julie sign uh, or her logo for this conference is why am I here? Well, I'm here because I got invited You've got to figure out why you're here, and I hope I'm going to help you do that during this talk. So, at any rate, Mary Ellen and I sit around sometimes and say, what are we doing with this Rotary thing? We talk about our Rotary journey, and it actually, for us, began about 28 years ago. And I think we have come to realize that we can do things together. And you've heard this mentioned already today. Barbara put this up earlier for you as well. There's some key things here about together and making meaningful impact. And so I think the thing that probably brings it all together for Marilyn and I in our Rotary life is the Rotary Foundation. And there are two aspects of Rotary I want to talk about there. One is friendship. Um, Gordon and, and some of your other past governors really touched me just a minute ago. They said things that the older past governors did say, well, I come to the dinner on Thursday night and 
and then I don't usually come back to the conference too much, but since you're talking, I came to hear you, and that meant a lot. And so, so friendship is my point, right? We're, we're all closer friends. We have friends, amazing friends here in, in Illinois, you do, all through the Southeast, um, all through the nation, and really through the world. And the second thing that the Rotary Foundation does <clears throat> is it allows us to make a difference. And it's a big difference because you couldn't make the difference that you could make this way by yourselves, right? So in the Rotary Foundation, you can make a difference and you can have more friends. Who could want more than that? <laughs> that just seems to me to be the ultimate um, um, goals that, that at least Mary and I have in Rotary. So, let me just uh, tell you something else here. This, I want to tell you a little story if I could. And um, many of you might recognize the story. Some of you will. Barbara Mullen will definitely recognize the story. So I'm just going to tell, it, tell a little story to you about a, a community that's 800 miles to the south of here. <coughs> the weather there is often warm as is common in the deep south. We don't have winter down there like you do. It, it, the quiet streets are lined by majestic live oak trees that are covered in Spanish moss. There are friendly schools, welcoming churches, beautiful gardens all nestled in this small town. The old part of town, small art galleries, excellent restaurants, and numerous shops that are filled with crafts and confections of any kind that you could possibly want to buy. The beach has sand on it that's, in my mind, like sugar. The sunset over this beach in the, ends each day with an amazing grace, orange light that highlights the majestic coastal skyline that's there every day. It's absolutely beautiful. A full moon coming over the bay is even more fantastic. The Gulf tides bring in an abundance of shrimp, fish, and other gifts from the ocean to the many fishermen. If you listen to the ocean lap along the shore, it gives you peace, calm, and you know you're in a special place. Children ride their bicycles on the seawall every day. Families spend days here excuse me, working, playing, and they're living their life to the fullest in this beautiful city. <clears throat> it's my hometown, and I guess you all probably know how you feel about where you grew up, but I definitely feel that way. And it's, it's a quaint place, and this is what happened to it. This is how it looked uh, on the morning of August the 29th. Twelve hours later, it looked like this. The Gulf Coast, as you know, was struck by a hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, back in 2005. And all of those things I just, just described to you were totally destroyed in 12 hours. People's homes, lives, jobs. The infrastructure was all gone. The depth and the breadth of this uh, the disaster was amazing. It went 150 miles into the state. It went 150 miles from New Orleans to the, to the east. Uh, listen to some of the statistics. 90,000 square miles were affected. 96 billion, with a B, dollars were lost. 175 mile an hour winds would gust in the 200s, maybe. On the barometric um, pressure measurements, 918 millibars, y'all don't really know what that means, but that means you had the most powerful hurricane in recent history. The 30-foot high storm surge was the highest that had ever hit our country. So from August uh, 31st, just show you a couple of things if I can. So this was the um, main street of one of the towns. Everything was gone. This was the beach road all the sewer water, all the infrastructure is gone. So I'm going to go here. Can y'all hear me okay? So I, I 
says something about you all, says something about me, says something about all Rotarians. They missed one meeting. We found them by putting a plywood sign on the on the highway in Maryland and I went down there the I guess the Wednesday after the Monday of the hurricane to be our first of thirty trips over two years. So we didn't know how we would get everybody together. So we put these plywood signs out, said there's gonna be a a cookout at a, a lady's house there that on Main Street and we brought an entire hamburger cookout in a trailer because there was nothing down there at all and that was a bit of a challenge but at any rate we Gene Wing my friend there was the chef and we had a, a group of Rotarians in the backyard with no electricity and got them back up and running very quickly and that culminated into um, a relief effort that that became, I guess, an eighteen-wheeler once a month for twelve months for about a million dollars, and I didn't do all this, but lots of my friends did. By the time Marilyn and I had gotten back to Jonesboro from our first trip down there, our Rotary Club already had an eighteen-wheeler parked in the front of it, a warehouse acquired, a conveyor system built. I learned a lot about shrink wrap and how to load it trailer truck and things like that in this time period. But we sent them the things that they needed and I think if I can, so this um, right here, that's Joe Williams. He's the emergency operations director for the Hancock County. And on his end, he acquired a warehouse and the way you did that after the hurricane, you went and said, this is my warehouse. So he <laughs> put a sign on it and we sent things to that warehouse for a, a solid year. Uh, I'll, I'll digress to tell you a quick story. So Marilyn, Marilyn and I were meeting with a, an unnamed relief agency and they were talking about all the things they had, this and that and the other. And we just didn't have a very good feeling about the whole meeting. So afterwards, it was out at the airport we circled back around in our car, got out, walked through the woods, and kind of went in the back door of their warehouse, and there were 200 shelter boxes sitting in their warehouse. Well, I got a little surgeon to wait, I guess, at that minute, and I asked them where they got those, and whose were they, and whatnot. So, uh, they, oh, those are ours, and no, those are not yours. Let's belong to Rotary, and some Rotarian, or a club, or somebody somewhere in the world's paid a lot of money for those to be distributed to the people who need them. So this young man was a hero that day. That, <clears throat> excuse me, he brought three pickup trucks and three or four city workers and we loaded every one of those boxes. And we set them up, and I'll tell you a story about this picture, at the local football stadium to be the housing for the kitchen crew for the next year that came out of California at the Calvary Chapel. And this truck, Mary Ellen has a friend in Jonesboro who put an 18 wheeler of kitchen equipment together and put the kitchen there at the same place and they fed a thousand people a day for about a year. So that was pretty amazing. And then we went to the mayor and we asked a silly question. It might be kind of a question you might ask your governor, you know, Julie, what can I help you with? Be careful of those kinds of questions. <laughs> because Eddie Farr said, well, I want to have Thanksgiving Day dinner. Two months after Katrina, no electricity, no running water. Well, who do you want to feed, Eddie? Everybody. <laughs> well, at that time, the population of Bay St. Louis had dropped down to about 3,500, 4,000 people. And so with volunteers, by the way, <coughs> volunteers from District 6490, volunteers from California, volunteers from Memphis area. We ended up with two or three hundred volunteers from everywhere, who, and we brought an entire Thanksgiving dinner down in a truck. And for the first time, and that's, let's see, this is kind of the shirt we designed for the day. Let me see if I can show you. So this was that day, and the saddest or the happiest things were people came up to each other and said, not how are you, how's your mom and him, as we say in the South. They said, 
I didn't know you were alive. I'm so glad to see you. <clears throat> very, very touching. So, we asked another dumb question. We said, well, Eddie, we did Thanksgiving dinner. We've got some kids some toys for Christmas, and what could we do now? And he said, well, we've got to do something meaningful. So there was some talk about building a pier. Well, nobody's going to give money for a pier that could be blown away in 12 hours. That was a bad idea. And so he said, well, what about if we build a building that everybody in the community can use? Now, keep in mind, this is a community that had nothing, not a single public building left that you could occupy. So we met with him. We met with some other folks. You might remember this guy. This is Haley Barber. Depending on your political leanings, he's either a good guy or a bad guy. But he was an excellent go governor after a disaster in Mississippi. And we walked out of this meeting with $2.7 million. And we put that together with a Bush Clinton grant of 500000 District 6490 and every other district in our zones contributed money. And before we knew it, we had $5.4 million. And um, you might, I don't know, do y'all claim that you know this guy? So that's Bob Stewart. He's from the district adjacent to you. He was the director at the time. And he gave us uh, a okay to get money out of what's called a district a donor advised fund is donor advised fund 25 for $50,000. And everybody here who has ever raised money knows to raise money, you need money. So we would use that money for architects and brochures and whatnot. And so this is the culmination of that. Here's the building. That's kind of how it looks. And one of the greatest things at the New Orleans Convention, we did a 450 person home hospitality and brought about six or seven buses, I guess, to Maryland, to and from New Orleans. And had a, Ronnie Cole was there, Barbara, who's a famous jazz person. And we had probably the most remarkable Rotary speaker in the Rotary world, Cliff Dockerman, was our keynote. That's probably why our attendance was so high. But anyway, let us know that this building could work and could do well. And there he, <clears throat> there he is, sadly, Mary Elena has passed away now of lung cancer. Cliff is still doing well. Mary Ellen and I were with him just the other day. And he's still going strong, sharp as ever. And if you haven't ever had the pleasure of meeting him, you really ought to go to California and meet him. He's an amazing Rotarian. So just to kind of <clears throat> give you a little bit of, um, um, I guess, summary of what happened so the building's 14,000 square feet. It has several extra meeting rooms. Um, something people don't know about the building that, that makes me the most proud is it's also an emergency operations center. If you open the back doors to the bathrooms, it opens them to showers. It has a kitchen that will easily feed 1,000 people a day. It has a full generator system. And it is, only, uh, it is built on the only piece of property in Bay St. Louis that was not underwater in Katrina. So it has a secret mission that nobody hopefully will ever have to use it for. But it, it now uh, generates about $50,000 a year for Bay St. Louis and the Hospital Association, the 4-H Club, the Rotary Club, uh, and every bride that's been married in Hancock County since 2005 has fought over having this as a venue for their reception. So it was pretty interesting. Um, I guess I wanted to just say this to you. So there's a donor board like there is in all buildings. And I was standing there before that donor board and you look at the donor board, it has 40 Rotary districts and 200 Rotarians. And there are people in this room whose name's on that board. Um, just let me just ask this quick question. Anybody here go to Bay St. Louis? Raise your hand if you got to go down there. Does anybody know of anybody who went from here? And see, this number of people in every district in our zones um, just tells you how giving Rotarians are. 
And I guess it goes back to my earlier comment. The reason this was all able to happen is because of the Rotary Foundation. So it's a pretty neat story in my opinion. So sometime around my birthday in 2010, I got to spend that in, in India. And then Barbara has done two nice talks about that a little bit. She talked about NID this morning and polio at her breakout today. If you haven't done this, you should do this. Just let me give you some statistics. This will be staggering if you think about it. So during this, this time, they do this three days at a time, four times a year in India. And I think, Barbara, you made a strong case as to why we have to keep doing it, even though we're not endemic in India anymore. As you know, polio is a ubiquitous disease. What that means is, I'll give you a quick example. I had a patient uh, several years ago. Does everybody know that diapers used to be cloth? <laughs> all right. So back in the day, as the, as the young people would say, see, I've got all the millennial jargon down. I can talk to everybody. But at any rate, this grandmother was changing her grandson's diaper. And within three days, she got a cold. And within four days, she became paralyzed. And I'm making that point to you to, for you to understand how, can, how contagious polio is. It's extremely contagious. The good news is that, or would correct me if I say something wrong, but I think about 80% of the cases, you never know somebody had it. But 20% of the people are paralyzed for life. So it's a deadly, deadly, easy to contract disease. At any rate, three times, so I'm sorry, four times a year, three days of each in India. So listen to these numbers. 170 million children are vaccinated in a three day period. 2.3 million people give the vaccinations out. There are 1.2 million teens takes 155,000 vehicles to do this, 220 million vaccines, and 50,000 Rotarians four times a year. That has to be, if not the biggest, but one of the biggest public health endeavors in the history of the world, and they do it four times a year. So, you know, what I've learned by going here is that these healthcare workers, they don't need you for anything to get the vaccine in the baby's mouths. These two teenage boys nearly <coughs> killed me. They took me up and down stairs, three-story stairs for a full day, and I just thought I was going to just die right there in India. They knew where every child lived. They knew who needed vaccinations. They knew which mothers were not going to be uh, that enthusiastic for their child to get vaccinations. But what they needed from us is they needed you, to, you and me and people like us to go there and wear a yellow vest and say, hey, I'm from the United States or I'm from Australia, I'm from Italy, but I care about what's going on, <coughs> excuse me, about what's going on here. That's what they need us for mostly. And of course, the money that you give is turned into the vaccines and all the things, the research and the education. So when you kind of think about this statistic, over the time that Rotary's been involved in polio, 10 million children have been saved. 4.5 billion with a B cases of polio have been prevented. All done through your financial support and your personal support as well at, uh, of these uh, polio endeavors around the world. can't go to India without seeing the Taj. <laughs> Do you know the British took all the jewels? Does everybody know about the Taj? Yeah, it's another story, we'll tell it another day. <laughs> so this is Romania, and there's a Rotary Club in Little Rock, um, I'll gladly tell you they're the 99th Rotary Club in the world. But they're a big, uh, fancy Rotary Club that does a lot of stuff, and very generous. They have lots of money at their disposal, so they came up with this idea that in Romania, in Cluj, Napoca, they could make a difference for the orphans. You, you've all heard of the Rom Romanian orphans. And so what happened is, um, 
they partnered with Heifer International, which if you don't know what that is, it's an organization in Little Rock that knows a lot about cows and chickens and temperature of milk and whatnot, the scientific side of farming. And they made a deal with the farmers in, uh, in Cluj that if they'd sign a contract to take care of the finest milk cows in the world out of Germany, the Holsteins, that they could have the milk to sell to their neighbors so they had a job and a way to make a living, but they had to give some of the milk to the orphanages and to the cheese factories. And this is, this is a funny story. I went to Romania to see this project when I was governor. And when we got there, the cow was tied up to the fence. It had a beautiful wreath of flowers around its neck. It had a bath. And the little family that was in charge of this particular cow had Kool-Aid and cookies for us, which in Cluj, that was like, you and I have a caviar. It was a big, big honor. And so we met the cow, we met the family, we saw the project. And um, what this has done is, is made two examples. The first grant was a 3-H grant, which we don't have anymore now, we call them global grants. It was for over 150,000, I think, and it ultimately culminated into a million dollar project. And then the Romanian government was getting a lot of complaints from the cheese factories that all these farmers are hand milking these cows and they're killing our cheese business. So the Romanian government, which rem remember it was an emerging communist country, said, well, you can't do that anymore unless you have a milking machine trying to put the farmers out of the business. So some Rotarians, and I believe you guys might be on this grant, decided it was a good idea to buy about 50 milking machines and send them to Romania. So the project continues to this day, feeding about 10,000 orphans every day, allowing families in Cluj to have uh, a, a job and, a, and an income. And one of the more touching things is the farmer's daughter was a teenager when I was there, and she looked like an American teenager. She had sunshade, she had fancy shoes, she had torn blue jeans, and she was just uptown on Saturday night because her dad had, had a job now. So that's pretty, pretty good to know. This just shows you the inside of the cheese factory, which was the side business. And so this project, what's nice about it is it's about a million dollar project that's sustained even today. It continues on its own, and there hadn't been rotary involvement in this in years. And of course, when the cows have baby cows, they make more milk, so that's pretty good. So now I'm going to take you to uh, Myanmar, or Burma, some people call it still. And um, Marilyn and I visited Myanmar, um, and it was a unique experience because everywhere you go in the world, if you don't know this and you have this little pin on, you get treated in a special way. In Romania, when I left the country with my rotary pin on, the customs guy got me out of line and said, oh, you're here helping us come this way, took me around the barrier, barrier and put me on the plane. In Burma, they don't know what a Rotarian is. And there's a lot of short people there with really big guns. And so we visited this, and we visited about 30 orphanages uh, over a several day period. And um, what's amazing is these children in orphanages, and they're just like everyone's children. They're happy, they smile, they play ball, they play soccer, they, uh, they live at 104 degrees. Their belongings are in a plastic tub at the foot of their little mat, that's their bed. But the, the um, this is Mary Ellen. What is that called? Thenakar? Thenaka? It's the makeup from tree bark. And as soon as we got out of the van for this day, these two little girls adopted Mary Ellen and put makeup all over her too. <laughs> and so this brings up a point. So one of the most important things about these orphanages are that in this country, as in many of the Southeast Asian countries, young girls can quickly be uh, pushed into the human trafficking. And so the plan in this part of the world was in Yangon and other places, which used to be Rangoon, I think. Um, 
they took the young ladies and got them in an orphanage away from the big city where they were safe. They got an education, they lived in safety away from people who would try to harm them. So a very important part of, of this of this. Let's see. That's just another view. Um, lots of monks there who are at odds with the government but do good for the kids. making the point, as I told you, these are just normal children, in spite of where they live and what they do. And what these projects were, were if an orphanage had running water, um, the project was to put a filtration system in so that they could have clean water. Um, you know, the gift of clean water in the most difficult of circumstances changed these children's lives for sanitation reasons, they could brush their teeth, they could have good fresh food, things that you and I take for granted all the time. This is one of the wells. And I don't know if you see it in this picture, but there were lots of these. And one of the neatest things to me was there's a cup and a toothbrush set around with people's names written on it, because they could finally brush their teeth. So, you know, there are projects like this all over the world locally right here in Illinois, other places far away. And it's through our relationships that we have and our passion that, that we share together that we can actually help others in a really impactful, big way. But the essence of our Rotary Foundation must be nurtured. So just like tailgating at Ole Miss, not everything stays the same. My dad and uncle came to the game, and they would not be any way but in a full coat and tie to go to a football game on the weekend. My mom and aunt would wear their Sunday best. When I was an undergrad, we didn't wear a coat, but we wore a tie. Now my cousins run around in Nike wear and Ole Miss wear, and so all that's changed. But when you think about it, the essence of the tailgating, the food, the decor, the chandeliers are still present. And the key thing is the fellowship remains the cornerstone of these unique special weekends. The things that make the tailgating experience valuable have to be consciously passed down to generation after generation. Even though some things change with the times, we have to preserve those things that we think are important. And so when you think about it on the on your left is the Ole Miss Creed, and on your right are the core values of Rotary. So in the same way, our need for more members, and you know how they're all talking about different strategies to get members. Our fresher image, and we really now had a conversation just a moment ago about the logo, has to be right. And the reorganization of the foundation through the future vision plan of a few years ago have caused significant changes in Rotary. However, in the face of these changes, we must preserve the ethics, the caring, the integrity, and the promotion of goodwill. We as Rotarians hold those things dear. We must continue to pass these values along as a legacy in a very conscious, intentional way. These are the essence of what we are when we say we're Rotarians. We must intentionally consider that you have to pass that on to our youth, our future leaders, our new members, and also to the world. We must preserve our core values and the principles of service above self. This has to be supported by fellowship, integrity, diversity, and leadership. So the next time that you are asked to support the Rotary Foundation, I want you to consider something. And by the way, you're about to be asked to support the Foundation in just a minute or two. So a new, a new community hall in Bay St. Louis in a destroyed community is really not just a building. It is safety. It is a beacon of hope. It is the future. Research and volunteers and vaccines and education in a polio-endemic country are not just an amazing public health project. 
This is the joy in a little one's eyes, the dreams of a better life. This is their future. In a faraway land, hosting milk cows, fresh milk every day, and delicious cheese, not only food and nutrition and entrepreneurship, it is a full tummy. It is a child's laughter. It is a calm, restful sleep. It is their future. In the jungles of Southeast Asia, a working water well and a proper sanitation is not just clean hands, healthier teeth, and clean clothes. It is knowing love. It is knowing happiness. It is their future. So as you give your time, expertise, and money to the Rotary Foundation, I want you to watch it turn into hope, joy, laughter, love, and happiness. This is what you're doing when you give money to the Rotary Foundation. There's an envelope on your table, and I hope you'll think about using Rotary Direct and attaching that to your credit card and helping for these kinds of projects. Thank you very much.